appreciate you joining us regardless. I am going to start off this morning by sharing my screen, hopefully. I'm And I have given uh, the same information to Nikki. So she's going to help me get this into the um, chat so that you can grab some of this information out of the chat. But we will also be um, adding this to our project website as well. Uh, and, and for those of you that were on the call last Friday or possibly... Um, this Monday, this past Monday, you may have heard uh, some of this information already, but we are uh, putting it all together in one uh, succinct location so that you can have access to it. And so I wanted to share it first thing this morning and also have Nikki put it in the chat for you. Um, and again, uh, it will be added out on our project website as well. But um, this is a little uh, sort of table or chart of um, uh, places that you can go for support and the types of information that you can find or the types of uh, support that you might need and where you can go to ask for that help. So uh, just I'll just run down through it really quick with you here, but starting at the top, um, the first item, you know, all issues, the first thing that you should do is try to self-help. Um, and then if you're unable to find the information that you need and the tools that are available to you, either out on the project website or in the Evergreen Help Center, um, then you should go to your agency support person. Um, they And the list of agency support people is out on our website at this link. If your agency does not have an agency support person, you can reach out to an ODES contact that's on this list for assistance. I know that question has come up several times. My organization doesn't have an agency support person. Who do I go to? There are people on this agency support person list that are ODES staff. You can use any one of those ODES staff persons um, as your agency support person if your agency does not have one. That being said, if your agency would like to have an agency support person and you do not already have somebody who has volunteered, you can reach out to us at evergreen.dhhs at main.gov and volunteer to be your agency support person if you if you are, would like to. Um, we also have this weekly meeting. Um, the intent for this weekly meeting is for uh, non-community case management, BI care coordination uh, type issues. So we're, we're looking to waiver provider support. So we're gonna be answering questions about authorizations, uh, service implementation plans, reportable events, that kind of thing on this call. Um, and this is the um, Zoom link. I know you guys are already here, but if there are other individuals in your organization that would like to participate. And, and this call is open to everybody. Um, anyone who would like can um, listen in. It's just we're gonna we're we're staying focused on those topics in this call. Um, and then if you have specific questions about authorizations or payments, uh, you can uh, email directly to resource coordinator odes at main.gov. I know that email address was shared out at the at the meetings uh, that I wasn't at. Um, so please feel free to email to that address. I would also like to just state that if you send an email there, please know that it will be responded to. There are some delayed um, response times for some of that just because of the volume that's coming in there. So, um, you know, please try to be patient and know that that, that um, email will be addressed um, in its priority and uh, order that it came in, um, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, again, try to be as patient as possible and you know, try not to keep reaching out and asking for updates unless it's been, you know, what you feel is a really unreasonable amount of time, uh, then you certainly can reach back out and ask for an update on that. But um, 
you know, they are, they are working that box and uh, trying to get those um, questions answered and those issues addressed as quickly as possible. As a community case management agency, um, if there are specific questions, uh, those can be sent directly to the hcbs.whatyouareatmain.gov email address. And then um, if you're truly unable to get into Evergreen, like your credentials are not allowing you to log in, those issues should go to FEI, our, our vendor at evergreen support at feisystems.com. Um, but uh, if you're able to get into the system, uh, then they're going to send that type of issue. And you think you don't have the right level of access, like maybe you have the wrong role, or you think you're not being able to see all of your locations, or you're seeing too many locations for your organization, or you're not, you don't believe you're seeing all of the persons that are assigned to your location, or something like that. They, if you go to Evergreen uh, FEI, they're going to send you back to us. Um, because um, roles and permissions, those are all handled by uh, my team here at ODES. So again, if you if you can't log in at all, like your credentials are not working, you can go to evergreen support at feisystems.com. But if you have questions, you, you think you don't have the correct level of access, then you should um, contact evergreen.dhhs.main.gov. Or if you have a new uh, staff person who needs a new user account, or if you have somebody who's leaving your organization and you want to terminate their account, those should also come to evergreen.dhhs.mean.gov. And of course, you can always find any of the um, recorded training videos and, and those documents that we uh, shared during our uh, pre-deploy training out on our website. And this is the link to that here. So again, Nikki's going to put all of this um, also in the chat for you, so you can grab these email addresses, these links, um, whatever you might need there. And we will also be putting this out on our um, project website as well. And, and also I'll be sending it out in the um, upcoming communication that will go out um, probably Tuesday or, or first thing on Wednesday morning of next week, um, which will go out to all users. So, uh, you yeah. know, Keep your eye out for that. But I just wanted to start this morning with that information in a, a little bit more succinct, um, digestible format for you. I know some of it was shared out um, over the course of the past couple of meetings that I uh, missed, but thought that that might be a helpful way for you guys to start off this morning. Um, so I also did mention it, but I'll, but I'll state it again just for... Um, just for everybody to hear one more time, um, if your agency does not have an agency support person and you uh, would like to um, volunteer, please reach out to evergreen.dhhs.main.gov. Um, if there uh, isn't an agency support person at your organization, um, but you don't wanna volunteer, you just wanna know who you go to for agency support, check the list on our project uh, page and um, go ahead and reach out to one of the individuals who's, uh, works for ODES that's listed on that, um, agency support person list. I also wanted to, um, before we dive into some specific topics, I know there was some conversation, uh, or there's been a lot of, uh, conversation around, um, the correct, uh, location information. So, uh, people feeling like they're not seeing the right um, organization or location names, addresses, NPI, NPI plus threes, things like that. Um, you're not, you feel like you're not seeing the correct information in Evergreen. Um, I know some of this again was addressed last Friday, but I wanted to clarify a little bit about what was shared last Friday. So all of that, um, full name information and address information that's displaying in Evergreen is being um, uh, brought into Evergreen from the MIMS system. And um, there, so if, if you feel like something is inaccurate there, it should be, uh, it was shared last week that you should open a maintenance case in uh, MIMS to update that. That is accurate information. That information should be edited in the MIMS system so that it will flow into the Evergreen system correctly. 
that process of um, creating a maintenance case and that maintenance case being completed is a multi-step process in the MIMS system. So when you first submit your um, maintenance case in MIMS, someone from the Office of Main Care Services will review that case and they'll ensure that everything is on that case that needs to be there. This is like a the first step. It's a, a screening process to ensure that um, everything is correct. If you're um, requesting a new location, so you're trying to do an enrollment case and you want to add a new location, the next step of the process is for uh, that, in, that um, enrollment case that has been screened and everything is there to be submitted to ODES for ODES approval for you to provide services um, for that location. So this is in the, uh, when your, your enrollment case is in the screening complete status. So it's gonna say screening complete in OMS, but that means it's now in the ODES approval process. Uh, that means that the information that you're still seeing there is not gonna be showing up in Evergreen yet. So you're still in step two. Once you get through the ODES approval process for new locations, and once you've gotten through the screening process for maintenance cases, then your case will go into the third stage, which is the finalizing contract stage. That's what the, I believe the status will in say, the status will say enrolled for those that are in an enrollment case. Um, and I believe they'll also say the same thing enrolled for maintenance cases, but don't quote me on that status. But they'll they'll go into this third status of enrolled. Um, this is when, uh, if you're a new location, uh, you're trying to enroll a new location, that's when you're going to be finalizing the contracts. So your case is not entirely completed in the MIMS system yet, but because you're enrolled, that content, that data will move into the, what's called the MIMS core tables. This then makes that data available for Evergreen to consume. So it's not until you see your maintenance case or your enrollment case go into that enrolled status, the day that it goes into that status, that evening, the data will flow over to Evergreen. And then if it's a new location, obviously, uh, somebody on our side still needs to set that location up. So it's still going to take a day or so. So once you see it go into an enroll, it's still going to take a day or two for new locations to be set up. We need to be aware that that um, data has become available in Evergreen and we can go ahead and set that up for you. Um, but addresses should automatically update. So once it goes into an enroll, if it's like an address update or name change update, um, it will go into that core table once it goes into enrolled and then the next night, that night it will come over to Evergreen and then the next day you should see the updated address um, reflected against that record in Evergreen. Now, reasons why this might still not happen is if the uh, location was set up in Evergreen but it was not correctly um, tied to or linked to the MIMS record, then it might not automatically update with the address information. Um, it should automatically link even if the location gets set up um, prior to it being available in that data. Um, it still should sh uh, link up and the address should automatically update. But if for some reason there was a, some human error, a typo or something like that, and it didn't, then that, that might be a reason that it would not display. If um, you know this data is uh, definitively in the core tables in MIMS and it's not reflecting in Evergreen, that's something that we definitely need to reach out to OMS to troubleshoot. So we are working with Olivia Hardman on those issues. I believe um, on last week's call, and I'll state it again, if you feel like this, um, you, your maintenance case is truly in the enrolled status and it's been there for at least 24 hours and you should be seeing that data at Evergreen, then you should go ahead and still email us at evergreen.dhhs at main.gov with those details and we will work with Olivia Hardman over at Main Care Services to try to figure out why that might not be um, correctly displaying in the Evergreen system. 
Uh, Tammy, I see that your hand is up. I know last week we uh, opened up the lines and let you guys chime in. I'm going to ask people to use the Q&A um, for today and because I do have some things that I want to get through and then we'll get to questions at the end. Um, so uh, if you have something related to um, locations, I can try to see if there's anything in the Q&A that is relevant there. Um, yeah, I see you put something in there, Tammy. Um, as for the correct level of access question, I've been asking since the beginning for something that states what the roles are and what access each role should have. Oh, yes, Tammy, I, I uh, heard that you asked for that on Friday's call um, as well. And Lisa had responded and said we we're working on that. Um, but we do not have that. Uh, document for what each of the roles are yet um uh but we we are working on that and we will get that out to you guys just as soon as possible we'll try to maybe get something uh i'm not sure if we can turn it around this quickly but we'll try to turn it around before we send out the um, communication next week um again that should go out on like probably tuesday night or first thing on wednesday morning so we'll do our best to try to get it uh, done by then but if not maybe uh we can have it by the end of next week for this for this call um, okay, and I think this is what you were trying to say, Tammy. Um, it used to be the location was manually entered. Is that not the case now when it feeds from MIMS to Evergreen? This is automatic now. No, uh, it's still manually added, Tammy. So um, the process is still the same in the sense that you guys would request your new locations in OMS. It's still the same step process that occurs in OMS, that three-step process that I just described. Actually, technically four, if you want to consider the contracts being sort of a fourth step. Um, that's all the same. Everything's still the same. It comes over to um, ODES in that approval queue, and we still need to manually add the location in Evergreen. But when we manually add the location in Evergreen, we are linking to a MIMS record now. So the difference is, is in EIS, we used to just manually add the location, and it never connected to MIMS. And so the data never stayed in sync. And we didn't need the data to be completed in MIMS in order to add it to EIS. We just added it to EIS when we received the information in step two. Um, the difference now is that we are linking to MIMS so that when you make address changes or name changes or you know those types of maintenance cases occur, that will automatically update but new locations do still need to be manually entered by my team. Um, and we need that data to be in the MIMS data set, the core data set. It needs to be through your enrollment case. It needs to be in that enrolled status in order for us to be able to see it in Evergreen and link to it properly. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit with locations. Again, if you're still questioning anything, um, uh, please, you know, uh, related to your locations, please uh, send that to evergreen.dhhs at main.gov and we'll try to get to the bottom of what might be going on there. Um, uh, excellent. So um, I see some people are adding some stuff to um, to the q and I am going to, I'm going to save those. I want to get through a couple of things related to um, reportable events um service implementation plans i think i've got a couple of things for pas one for psp bmp safety device plans and one for pcps before i go uh to the q a but but do enter your questions into the q a and we'll try to get to them before the end i want i'm circling back to some questions that were asked way back on the 22nd that still hadn't been answered and i want really want to try to make sure that we're getting answers to all of your questions um so that these are some questions that have come up um back on our meeting on the 22nd that didn't get answered last week. Um, so related to reportable events, um, someone had asked uh, about um, reportable event uh, provider role, um, not being able to see migrated reportable events. And, and then this did come up uh, quickly on Friday as well, but I thought it was important to reiterate it. Um, so reportable events that migrated from 
EIS did not have the organization data attached to them. It was a uh, migration issue that we're aware of. Um, and because of this, uh, the way access works in Evergreen, reportable event provider, external provider roles can only see uh, forms and plans that were created by someone within your organization. And because that organization data was not attached to those reportable events, you as external reportable event provider users cannot see those reportable events. They did migrate, they are in there and ODE staff can see them and other roles that can see um, all reportable events like community case managers or BI care coordinators, they can see them, but you can't see the migrated EIS ones because that organization information, that, that piece of data was not migrated with that record. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, and they all, all, all reportable events migrated in a completed state. So you can't edit them anyway. They, they migrated over as completed. So um, the only uh, significant issue here is that you might still need to add a provider follow-up to those reportable events. And you can't do that because you can't see them. So it was shared on Friday. It was also shared out, um, I believe, as part of the email communication a week ago. Um, that you should fill out the paper form. We, we've created a paper provide uh, reportable event provider follow-up form that has been uploaded into the Evergreen Help Center. Um, so you should fill that out and send that to evergreen.dhhs at main.gov. And um, someone on my team will enter that uh, against the correct reportable event for you in the system. Um, so I can actually uh, try to share my screen again really quick and show you where that is. The help center. So in Evergreen, you're going to want to go here to the Help Center. And you're going to want to um, find, oh, oh, maybe I'm lying to you. I never want to be lying, but I don't see that it's been uploaded yet. Yep, I'm not seeing it. So we will take a note of that. We'll get that uploaded in there. But this is where it would be. Um, you can see here the uh, SIP instructions are here. The person-centered plan instructions are here that were uh, discussed on last Friday's meeting. And then also our original person-centered plan um, quick tips and our prior authorizations quick tips. So we've got four um, manuals in here right now, documents in here right now for you to be able to uh, help troubleshoot. And this is also where the paper form will be uploaded of the um, provider follow-up. I'm just checking action for myself on that so that we make sure that gets up there. Um, also a uh, question around reportable events. Um, 
that came up was uh, can an organization that did not enter the reportable event, like in Evergreen, like a new reportable event that gets entered in Evergreen, can an organization that did not enter that reportable event complete the follow-up on that? Like an example here would be the community case manager entered the event, but the residential provider is responsible for the follow-up. Can the residential provider go to that event that was entered by the community case manager and do the follow-up. And similarly, if a CCM created an event and a follow-up, can a responsible provider um, attach a paper follow-up to that event? Um, the answer here is no. Again, because of the access control, you won't be able to see that reportable event that got created by somebody else in a different organization. So you wouldn't be able to add the um, follow-up. But what you can do is um, you can complete that paper follow-up form and give that to the person who did create the reportable event, and they could attach that to the reportable event uh, form. Or you can create a separate um, reportable event and do your provider fo uh, follow-up on that reportable event that you created. Um, another question that was uh, previously asked is, is there a way to put a date range uh, to search reportable events for an entire agency, like all clients at once, rather than having to search by individual client, like going into each individual client and searching for their reportable events? Yes, uh, eventually there will be. Ultimately, there will be a way for you to do this. There is a report that will allow you to do this. It's called the All Completed Reportable Events Report. Um, right now, I don't believe that's available to you as reportable event provider users because there was a security issue with it, but we are um, actively working to resolve that. I think it's in testing right now, so it should be rolled out really soon for you to be able to pull that all completed reportable events report if it's not already um, in your reports uh, module. Um, also, uh, there was a question about, um, actually I should just check this really quick. Let me confirm this. Let me just share my screen again really quick here. So there was a question um, uh, from back on uh, the 22nd about um, reportable events and being able to see the title. Uh, and or description of the reportable event in EIS, but not being able to see those in um, Evergreen. So if you're on the all forms list page in Evergreen, you're uh, only going to see um, these columns of data, the form ID, the form type, the program, the create date created by last modified, last modified, by status, uh, stat, last status change date active. That's all of them. I think I'm showing all of them. Yep. Um, so the, those are the only columns that you're going to see on this all forms list page. That's why it's really important. And we, and we always talk about going to your custom list page because some of the custom list pages have additional columns of data that are available to you, specifically your person centered plan your um, uh, prior authorization and your reportable events page. There might be a couple of other ones, but those three in particular, they have additional columns of data that you can see. So it's gonna be easier for you to find the reportable event that you're looking for if you use your little filter icon or your hamburger or your upside down pyramid, whatever you wanna call this um, filter icon up here you use that and you go to the reportable event forms and plans list page, custom list page, 
then you're going to see all of these columns of data for your reportable events, form ID, form type, program classification, all of the incident categories that were selected, the create date created by, last modified by, um, or last modified date, last modified by, the status, the last status change active, and um, yeah, I'm showing all of them, and this one's really long because there's a lot of incident categories selected here. Um, so it's making this one row very long. Um, but also you have this little carrot icon over here to the right. It's called a drawer. We call that a drawer. You can click that and it will drop down this extra drawer here that will also show you the report title um, and some additional details, uh, the reporter name, location, incident discovery date, start date, end date, case manager acknowledgement date, follow-up due date, follow-up complete date. Um, I don't know if any of these, these are all sort of like in progress here. I don't know if any of them have that. Um, yeah, so here you can see this has the report title, um, reporter name, uh, location, stuff like that. So, so hopefully that will be uh, helpful for um, whoever it was that was asking the question way back on March 22nd about um, being able to find um, reportable events a little bit easier um, from the UI. Also, uh, this is where you'll find the report that I was talking about, the all completed reportable events once you have access to that, if you don't already have access to that. Um, and I'm not gonna run this because I don't wanna give um, data, but you can, you can filter by, um, I want to see all of them. It defaults to all of them, or I only want to see ones that have been acknowledged by the case manager, or I only want to see ones that are completed but haven't been acknowledged by the case manager, or I only want to see the ones that I haven't finished yet that are in progress and I haven't submitted yet um, or haven't been submitted by somebody from my organization. Um, closed is, again, uh, discarded. It, it was a reportable event that was uh, created by accident or in error, and so it was set to closed but it will default to show you all of them, but you can filter down to different ones and you can filter by date range and it will default to the, the month that you're currently on. Um, again, I don't wanna um, share information I'm in production, but um, the report itself will uh, provide uh, quite a bit of um, detail for you as well. Um, so this might be another source of information for you related to um, report uh, titles and descriptions. Um, I was just trying to run it really quick so I could tell you what columns of data are in there. Um, uh, while I'm waiting for that to come up, uh, there's another question around for reportable event, events around um, witness and participant section and uh, only being able to select um, certain um, people from the staff dropdown. Um, and so there was a question about uh, what if we need to enter a direct service professional or what if um, there's a staff person at my organization who isn't in the dropdown? How do we get like direct service professionals or another staff person from my organization entered on the reportable event if they're not showing up in the staff person? drop down. Um, and the answer to that question is um, the only people that are going to show up in the staff person drop down are uh, users, system users. Um, so if you have staff that don't have evergreen user accounts, they're not going to show up there. If it's a direct service professional that doesn't have a uh, evergreen account, they're not going to uh, necessarily show up there. So you would want to select the option of other uh, in order to add those people uh, to a reportable event as a witness or a participant. When you select the option of other, it's going to give you text fields to enter their name and their title and all that information so that you can add them to the reportable event. There was also a question or a comment about um, uh, individuals who no longer work for the organization still showing up in that um, drop down. I, I didn't get a chance to confirm before this call, but I, I believe that that was by design. 
And the reason is, I think it's showing all of your active and inactive staff. And I think the reason for that was um, if you're entering a reportable event, excuse me, uh, you know, you, you just uh, learned of the event uh, today, but it occurred, you know, weeks ago, months ago, maybe a year ago. Sometimes you learn of reportable events well after the fact because they were never disclosed to you. The information was never disclosed to you. Um, you might still want to be able to add that staff person. So I believe the inactive staff are still showing up in your drop down for that purpose. Um, but I will confirm that um, and make sure that I get back to you on that. But I believe that that's why you're seeing um, inactive staff in there um, when you select that list as well. Um, uh, also reportable. Uh, Uh, I also I also tracked a question um, from somebody again. I think this was back from the twenty second. So apologies that these are kind of delayed responses. But um, someone had indicated that they noticed that they weren't getting the question about why a reporter had uh, why a report had a delay in being submitted. And their example was they're entering reports from over the weekend. So they're coming in on a Monday and they're entering their reportable events that occurred over the weekend. And they're not getting that question of uh, why a report, uh, why there was a delay in the report. Um, and that is uh, also intentional and by design. If you're entering reportable events on a Monday, you're not getting the question about the delay, uh, you know, for something that happened over the weekend because that, um, conditional question is calculated based off business days. So weekend days are not counting against you for a delay in reporting. So if, you know, you catch up all your reportable events by Friday, you come in on Monday and you're entering reports from Saturday and Sunday, you're not going to get that conditional question about a delay in report for events that occurred on Saturday or Sunday. Um, it, it's based off business days that that's being counted. Um, and then, uh, someone else asked, uh, how, how do we see a reportable event notification as a case manager? Um, they had indicated there that they were only, uh, knowing when this was happening, when a provider lets you know, um, unfortunately we've had some issues with the notifications, not triggering. Uh, we did escalate a ticket to FEI, um, our vendor, um, a week or so ago, and they're trying to help us resolve that. Um, so apologies that community case managers and BI care coordinators are not receiving your notification when reportable events are entered right now, um, that those should start triggering again soon. Um, again, we are uh, high priority trying to resolve the notification issues. Um, so those were some of the reportable event questions. Uh, before I move into service implementation plans, I will also just share that all completed reportable events report does give you a lot of columns of data, including um, the person's evergreen ID, name, date of birth, main care number. It links you right back to the form. Uh, it gives you the report title, the uh, incident detail or the description, and the immediate response. Um, as well as uh, a bunch of additional uh, columns of data. So that's another um, way that once you have access to that report, that you can go ahead and um, run that report to get all of your reportable events for your organization. It will have all the titles, the descriptions, and allow you to sort, sort that way. Um, so moving into, um, sorry, I didn't realize my video had stopped on you guys. Um, Moving into service implementation plans, um, there was an outstanding question about um, will providers only have access to a SIP uh, once the case manager has initiated the process? Yes. So um, the community case manager or the BI care coordinator will need to invite the provider. This initiates the process of the system creating that SIP form and the provider being able to fill out that SIP form. Now, please keep in mind that if you're 
uh, being invited as a brand new provider, you've never provided services to this person, you will not have access to the person record yet. And we still have the workaround in place that um, the community case manager or BI care coordinator would need to reach out to you and ask you to fill out uh, the SIP in the uh, fillable form, the, the template, the paper template, and they'll need to attach that SIP to the um, SIP to the PCP uh, SIP form for you um, because you don't have access to the person record until you've been selected as their provider. But if you are already a provider providing services and there needs to be an edit to your SIP, you do have access to do that in the system. Um, if you're being reselected as a provider, uh, you may still have your active um, assignment to that person and you may be able to still fill out your SIP um, directly in the system. Um, there was also uh, co some conversation on Friday about um, when you uh, go into the SIP report, you have some uh, that are still saying that they're in progress from like years ago, um, like August of 2023. Um, and, and how do you deal with that? Um, uh, there was some conversation about uh, leaving that as in progress and letting it drop off. I'm not sure that that uh, will work. So I, I will uh, follow up on that for you. But um, there, there is some intention for uh, my team to clean up some of those old um, service implementation plans and get them closed out or set to complete so that they're not showing up on that report for you anymore. And they're not um, copying forward on your PCPs. So um, that's uh, in progress going to be happening over the course of the next several weeks. And I think I had mentioned it um, a week ago, Friday, so two weeks ago now today, um, that we would be doing that. And so be prepared that we'll be modifying some of your data in order to get that cleaned up for you. Um, myself again on that one too, to make sure that we get that uh, resolved and we get some clear guidance for you on that. Um, as it relates to prior authorizations, um, we had some providers that were, uh, that have been asking for access to those PA forms uh, under the forms area. Um, I just wanted to clarify as well. I know there's, that's a question that's been asked several times is do, are we always going to have to um, access PAs from the report or can we gain access to the prior authorization forms themselves? Um, unfortunately, again, the way access is controlled in the system, there is no way for us to provide you access to the PA forms. Um, they are created by individuals at ODES or within the state. And so because of our access control, you as external providers cannot see those forms over there. That's uh, by design. Uh, so we are trying to make sure that the PA utilization report has all of the data that you need on there. Um, I know one of the items that we've been working to add there is the hours per week. That was a request that comes from the PCP. It's a little trickier and we're getting added to the report now. Um, I know uh, last week it was asked if rate could be added there. Um, that is not currently in the works, but I can certainly escalate that up to add that to that report as well. But we do need to make sure that that report has all the data that you need on there because that will be uh, for the foreseeable future that will be how you um, access prior authorization data. It would be a major uh, system enhancement for FEI for all of their clients uh, in order to give you access to the prior authorizations under the forms and plans. So I, I don't see that happening for, for a very long time. So we need to find a way for the report to work for you. So if there are other enhancements to that report that are needed, please let us know and we'll um, try to get those raised up and get that report so that it's got all the data that you need on it. Um, when you run that PA utilization report, there are also some filters that you can use uh, when running that uh, that will help you uh, narrow down to only seeing uh, the data that you want to see. I know some people were saying that they were um, wanting to know like when had a um, prior authorization been updated. So uh, 
also when you go to the reports module, there's um, maybe I can try to screen share again really quick. So there's lots of uh, filters that you can use here. You can run it by the default. It will default to uh, the current month, so uh, April. If you wanted to go back and change these, you can change those to March. It will default to selecting all of the decisions. So the decision is what was made by the resource coordinator. So did they approve it? You probably want to use approve or approve. There's a couple of different ones here based on migration. Um, you probably want to select both of them. For now, um, canceled, meaning again, it was created an error and we needed to like, or, or we wanted to cancel it because we replaced it with a new one or whatever. So that's uh, like no longer active, canceled and denied. It was requested, but denied. I think very rarely you'll see something in the denied status um, or something that doesn't have a status yet, meaning um, it's been requested, but it has not yet been approved, denied or canceled or uh, the resource coordinator has not requested clarification on it. If the resource coordinator has requested clarification, it would be in this test. So it defaults to including all of those. You can leave it that way, or you can um, you know, reduce that to specifically what you're looking for. So if you're looking for something that has been um, completed by the resource coordinator, then you're gonna wanna use approve, approved, deny, possibly cancel if you wanna see ones that have been replaced. Um, you would wanna remove these null, that means they're still in progress with them, or these request clarification, that means it's still in progress with them. If you wanna see the ones that are in progress, those are the statuses you would wanna use, null and request clarification. If you wanna see um, based on it being processed by MIM, so the decision is what happens when your resource coordinator or your care monitor has reviewed and done their piece. And then once it's, they've completed their approval, it gets sent over to MIMS that evening and then MIMS will process it and it will return a result. If you wanna review your PAs based on those outcomes, the MIMS outcomes, it's gonna to default to all when you run the report, but you can update this to just say, I only wanna see the ones that were accepted, meaning MIMS was able to process them without any trouble. Or I only wanna see the ones that MIMS wasn't able to process. That's gonna come in under errored and if you do that, it will tell you why it erred. It will give a description and then you can work with your resource coordinator or someone at OMS to try to get that resolved. Um, if you want to see um, ones that have not gone over to MIMS, then you're going to want this null category. So if you're selecting decisions over here of like null and um, uh, request clarification or even possibly canceled or denied, uh, you're going to want this null status because that means it didn't go over to MIMS yet. And then again, you can also, depending on your organization, you may uh, have PAs in multiple programs, um, so you can filter down by that. So there's lots of filter options there so that when you run the report, you're seeing uh, less data to make it a little bit um, easier to digest that. Um, so I am conscious of time here. I do have some stuff in the q and A. I I do wanna just quickly uh, state these couple of other things around PSP, BMP, and then I'll see if I can grab a couple of the items in the Q&A. Um, so uh, PSPs, BMP safety device plans. Uh, there was a question a while ago. I know we've shared some of this information, but I thought that it would be worth sharing again, just for everybody to hear it one more time, um, whether providers will have access to complete PSPs and BMPs in the system. Um, this individual, again, this was from the 22nd, they were saying, I can't do attachments for PSPs and the BMP cannot be added until the PSP is complete. So um, yes, the attachments access will be restored. So um, right now we had to shut that off for access uh, security reasons. We had to shut attachments access off, um, but we are working with the vendor FEI to restore that access in the, in the next few weeks, hopefully, um, fingers crossed. Um, but uh, in the meantime, it, PSPs should still be completed. You should still be um, filling out PSPs. Those are done outside of Evergreen anyway. They're uploaded as an attachment. So you should still be filling them out on the paper form outside of Evergreen. 
Um, and then once it comes time for a BMP, those can be added in Evergreen without the PSP being uploaded to the person's record. So you can uh, still proceed by, uh, with submitting a behavior management plan um, uh, form in Evergreen uh, without that PSP being uploaded to the person's record. Now, I know there are still some challenges for external providers in filling out the BMPs because of the um, inability to add attachments to that behavior management packet. That's also been escalated as a priority issue. So uh, hopefully that will also be resolved uh, along with this atta these attachment issues and you'll be able to um, do those uh, BMPs in the system. So for right now, um, we had told everybody uh, through April 1st to submit your BMPs through the um, crisis uh, email address. Uh, go ahead and continue to submit those there until you hear otherwise. Um, and then we'll let you know when all that all those issues have been resolved and you're able to submit them again in um, Evergreen. And uh, related to safety device packets, uh, we were recent. The question was: We were recently told that providers need to complete the safety device request packet and then send it to the community case manager to submit um, for approval. Yes, that will always remain true. So again, uh, just repeating information that's been shared: um, external providers, you will not have access to submit the safety device packet in Evergreen. That will need to be done by a community case manager or a care coordinator. And the purpose or reason behind that is again, because the need for a safety device must be documented in the person-centered planning process. So the need either needs to be captured in the comprehensive assessment and or the PCP in order for you to create the safety device packet um, or the safety device packet to be created. So, um, because then that PCP needs to be attached to that packet. So as a provider, if a safety device is needed, you should still uh, fill out the request forms and get the signatures and then remit those to the case manager and the case manager should document the need in the PCP and then fill out the packet, attach that PCP and your request forms um, to that packet and submit that for approval. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to share before I grab a couple of items from the Q&A uh, is around PCPs. Um, so there was an item, when printing or saving a PCP, um, are the attachments automatically part of the printed document? No. Um, so the PCP, the person PCP print is gonna give you just the form that's in Evergreen. So if you need to also print the attachments, you need to open up the attachments on that PCP and print those individually. They are not gonna just automatically print as part of the um, uh, person PCP print. Uh, so going to the Q&A real quick here, um, see what we can get through in the last four minutes. Um, Anita asks, uh, where can we get workflow graphics that show each step for an annual or changed PCP and editing the SIP? Yeah, great question, Anita. So uh, we do have the PCP manual it has not uh, been updated yet to reflect the evergreen uh, screenshots and terminology, uh, but we do have somebody that is working to update the person-centered planning manual. Um, we hope to get that out to you soon. We do not have um, uh, a document yet, a step-by-step -step document yet for uh, how to edit the service implementation plan, but you can go back to uh, your training, the training sessions on how to fill out service implementation plans, but we will uh, definitely add that to the list of documentation requests and try to get you step-by-step uh, -step instructions for filling out the SIP. Um, Anita's also asking when the case manager opens the PCP for annual update or changes, we lose access to the person and cannot enter reportable events. Is there a solution for this? Yeah. Um, so why that's happening is when the community case manager, um, geez, it shouldn't be happening when they open the PCP for the annual update. It should only happen when they set the plan to complete. So 
Um, uh, Lisa, can you work with the team to see if there's a um, an issue already in the tracker for um, provider? It sounds like provider access might be being removed when um, a, a PTP is being revised as an annual change type and it has not yet set, been set to completed. Um, yeah, I can I can take that back and see if I can find any. any yeah, they shouldn't be losing access. So as a provider, you should not lose access to the person's record until the new plan has been set to complete. And then you would only lose access if you have not been selected as a provider. So you should still be retaining your access there. So we'll definitely escalate an issue if um, one doesn't already exist. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Shirley is asking, um, is sending the follow-up form to that email secure or is there a way to secure the form? Um, yeah, uh, you definitely want to um, send your email as a secure email. So we can put together some instructions for how to um, set an email to uh, confidential. Um, when you're attaching those forms and sending those uh, to us. Um, I'll track an action around that as well. Instructions for Um, and I do see we're almost at the end of the time here, but I'll take this one more question here uh, from Pete. Is there any work being done to have the number of Section 13 units calculated correctly in compliance with main care? Yeah, great question, Pete. Um, so uh, I think there is uh, some guidance around this. I think it's out on our FAQs, but um, that... Uh, Evergreen does track the units um, for um, uh, like progress notes, but it is up to the uh, provider organization to um, calculate the partial units still. Uh, so I can definitely find that guidance and uh, make sure that that gets um, recirculated to you. Uh, so there is no um, active plan to uh, modify Evergreen for that uh, at the current time. Um, you would need to uh, pull your um, note report, which again, uh, there there is a security issue with the note report. So we did send those um, note audit report details out to you by email for um, February and we'll uh, potentially have to do the same thing um, for March if we're not able to get that report resolved for you in the next week or so. Um, but it would be up to you as a provider to determine uh, when you do your claims uh, whether there were partial units and, and those need to be adjusted. Um, so there are still a few questions that I did not get to, but I do want to be respectful of people's time. It is 9.01, so we will go ahead and grab these uh, questions out of the Q&A and we will uh, try to respond to those next Friday or possibly even uh, earlier in the upcoming um, communication that will go out early next week. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us uh, in spite of our nor'easter. And I hope everybody stays warm and safe. And if you don't have power, I hope your power comes back soon. And have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend.